Okay, so welcome to this uh, last lecture. After having studied several uh, special cases, I'll uh, start now in this final in this last lecture with a uh, more general uh, approach from which uh, uh, some other particular cases will emerge, but uh, the focus uh, will be on uh, on general results. So I'll start with the, so we remember, uh, I think what the setup is, the, what I want to look for is a uh, vacua. So uh, just to be clear, uh, it is, so why am I focusing on vacua? For Calabi-Aus, we first looked for the vacua and then we um, looked for effective theories. Some people feel sometimes that it's um, one can proceed in the opposite direction. So you first select uh, some internal space in some way. And then you, from that, you, uh, you derive an effective, uh, an effective action. The problem, so the, and then from that effective action, you can look for um, for some new vacua. So this approach uh, does work sometimes. Uh, the problem is that you need some uh, pretty good way to uh, to guess what the internal space for this um, for this uh, effective action is going to be. Uh, currently, there are uh, some proposals. For example, uh, you can take the Calabiao spaces that we have studied earlier and add some flux, for example. And that gives you some uh, effective action, which often doesn't, so in the supergravity approximation doesn't have vacua, but then you can add other effects. So we'll get back to, the, if time permits, we'll get back to this approach um, at the very end. Or some, uh, there are the spaces that you can try working with, like uh, spaces with uh, lots of symmetries, it's, uh, like uh, uh, the opposite extreme. But um, the approach I will pursue is uh, sort of the other way. So I'll first look for vacuum solutions. And once you have a vacuum solution, you can uh, try saying, OK, now let's look for the effective action around this vacuum solution. And what is a vacuum solution? It is, uh, according to my definition, a maximum symmetric uh, space cross an internal manifold. And six in type two, but you can easily uh, generalize this idea to, to um, 11 dimensional supergravity, for example. The metric has this form. with the warping function A of the internal coordinates. And we saw that the dilaton is only a function of the internal coordinates. So it's the warping function, as I just said. H, the Schwartz tree form is purely internal. And then last time we saw another, uh, we saw the F-theory class where there is also a one form, uh, Ramon Ramon one form. And in that case, it had to be purely internal too. So you might uh, then start thinking, okay, perhaps I can always uh, take the flux to be purely internal, but that's not quite right because the, if, you're, uh, if you consider a form which has um, which is of degree four or higher. There's also the possibility without breaking any symmetry of uh, the maximum symmetric space to of um, allowing for a, for a Ramon Ramon field along the space time. In fact, we saw or partially along the space time. So if it's a four form, it can be proportional to the volume form of the, uh, of this, and this wouldn't break of the MS4, and uh, this wouldn't break any symmetries. But uh, even if it's a five form, for example, it could have 
it could be this wedge uh, one form in M6. We saw an example actually in one dimension higher uh, already yesterday where we had the um, solution ADS5 times uh, Sasaki Einstein. And in that case, the flux, uh, the pipe form was um, both compute internal and also compute external. So summarizing this discussion, you can allow F to be both purely uh, internal. Let me write it like this for, for the time being. And also, wall four wedge some form f x both f int and f x are internal forms it's called x only because it uh, it appears in uh, components of the ramon ramon flux which is uh, purely external However, we saw that this uh, total F was made of uh, fluxes that uh, had a duality property. So, this was, for example, in two A, contained all the even forms all the way to F10, and then there were duality properties Connecting each k form to uh, the, ten, the corresponding ten, minus, uh, ten minus k form. And in to be, that's a similar property. Formally, this extends the self duality property of F5, which is already present in the ordinary uh, description of uh, type 2, non democratic, in the authoritarian uh, version of uh, autocratic version of, uh, of the type 2. Uh, this can be summarized with the uh, lambda operator that we introduced at some point, which is uh, just, in fact, just uh, made in such a way to yield uh, precisely this um, the signs. So it, it gives a plus on uh, zero on one forms, minus on two forms and three forms, plus again on four and five forms, and so on. So when I write something like this, because of this property, there is a, a duality also on the, uh, the connecting the small f with the, so this small f int, the effects. And we can say that f x is simply, um, you might think it's a star lambda, just a star lambda of uh, f int. But the, uh, because of this uh, uh, factor of the warping here, there's a e to the 4a. Check this. It's an easy exercise. It's just an exercise in using the star. So then from now on, uh, we will call the internal flux 
just f, little f. In other words, we'll express everything in terms of the internal flux. The external flux will be will be left understood. It will be understood that the total flux has this expression. And once again, vol four is the volume form of the uh, maximally symmetric space MS4. So given this, we can uh, then plug this, uh, these conditions for, uh, given all these, uh, these uh, requirements for a vacuum solution, We can then go back to the equations of motion, to the general equations of motion, and get a set of reduced equations of motion that only involve functions and forms of the internal space. So the, of course, the uh, problem of vacuum solution becomes purely internal. so to speak. Stands to reason that if you have completely fixed everything in the external directions, uh, all you have to do is decide how things behave in the internal directions. If we want to look for supersymmetric solutions, we also, uh, need to understand how, what to do about the uh, supersymmetry parameters. This we discussed already. In full generality, well, there, is, uh, there are quite a few possibilities for, the, for how you decompose zeta one and zeta two in uh, sorry, epsilon one and epsilon two in zetas in 4D. And etas in 60. Uh, sorry, now we are in, again, upper sign is two way. Lower sign. is to be. And what we saw in the F theory class holds more generally for any vacuum solution with a non-zero on a Schwartz. namely that we need to take these to be equal. We studied the uh, vacuum with F equals zero earlier, and we saw that there isn't much there. I, sorry, I have to make a, a cross to Mira now that I, um, I'm being slightly imprecise. Uh, the imprecision is this. We, I told you that we, um, so we found a no-go due to the fact that we didn't have any orientifolds involving um, near Schwartz field. This is not completely true. There is um, a possible avenue that no one has um, fully explored, I think, which is that uh, you might try to look for solutions where there is, um, which involve a certain less known object called the ONS5. This is the S dual of an O5. And it would be a source, a negative tension source for um, uh, which, uh, which would act as a source only for the near shorts reform. Is some exotic possibility that I've never seen realized. Um, up to that, uh, no, I think 
with that possibility, no one has really proven that there are no solutions, no compact solutions. But uh, besides that little corner, we'll, um, well, we know that uh, to uh, obtain compact solutions, we need orientifolds and hence uh, Ramon Ramon uh, fields. And hence we'll take this from now on. In any case, uh, from, uh, with f equals zero, we studied already the equations. And now the uh, also the supersymmetry equations become purely internal. And they, quite honestly, become a bit of a mess. So I don't think I want to write the whole uh, system. But uh, for example, the the internal gravitino yields. this equation. Uh, now it's in lowercase gamma because it's the gamma <laughs> in, uh, in the internal directions only. This is a one. And then there's a similar one. This are internal gravitino. And you could have a plus minus here. So So these are already not too inspiring, but then there are four more. In the uh, F-theory case, we were um, a bit lucky because the, the, the resulting six equations of the, well, first of all, of the resulting six equations, we only looked in detail at uh, four of them. And moreover, of those, um, they, they recombined in pairs because we had taken the etas to be equal and or rather one equal to y the other. And those two equations were re reducing to the same equation in pairs. So they collapsed to three equations. We looked at two of those. But in full generality, when f is a um, polyform with uh, all possible degrees, I don't recommend that approach. It has been uh, attempted, but uh, it led to, um, to a labyrinth of uh, possibilities. So instead, I'll, uh, I'll give my favorite approach, which um, you might say that the heights a bit, uh, the, so the complexity a bit, but I would say it reformulates the complexity in a way which looks at this to me uh, mathematically more meaningful. So the, uh, basically what we are trying to answer is the following question. So they, for, the, um, for the case without any fluxes, the problem reduced to, the, to finding a covariantly constant spin off. So the problem of vacua was the, um, reduced to the problem of holonomy in the internal space. And then we saw that for the um, Ramon, Ramon, for the, in the in presence of uh, Neve Schwartz already, it wasn't like that. So the, we got some elegant looking um, 
sup uh, supersymmetric equations, the host dominger uh, system, but it wasn't uh, necessarily reformulated in terms of holonomy. Something I didn't say is that in that case, some people try to uh, just reinterpret this as a connection with torsion. And so people have tried to uh, say, oh, okay, but uh, this is uh, a special holonomy, but with torsion. That approach has been tried in the case with the, where these other terms, the Ramon Ramon terms are present, but it seems to fail. So basically we are looking for some elegant looking mathematical condition that replaces the notion of holonomy for general vector. We kind of saw already the, uh, the matrix. In the uh, case with only never short fluxes, I, at some point I proposed, I suggested using this by spinners. The, um, so we saw that they, contain the forms in uh, J and Omega that we had previously um, introduced. The eta plus eta plus dagger is uh, formal exponential of J and uh, eta plus eta minus dagger is Omega. Moreover, perhaps I didn't stress, enough, stress it enough, but that was uh, enticing because they, those are also um, E to the minus AJ and Omega also play the role in uh, mirror symmetry we saw also in the modular space of Calabiaos. So they, they were not a random uh, set of uh, forms. But then we might try to do the same here and use uh, by spinos like this in the general case as well. Remember that the by spinos are equivalent to uh, polyforms, after all. So if we manage to find elegant equations, uh, then uh, the, we, we can uh, try to rewrite everything in terms of differential forms, which uh, uh, puts in communi uh, potential in communication with uh, um, more elegant mathematics. However, here we, have to, we haven't taken eta one and eta two uh, to be equal anymore. I don't want to do any answers at this point on the internal uh, space. I've already made an answer uh, for the external uh, spinos, but I, I argued that I was forced to do it. So which shall I consider? Here there are four possibilities. I have one, one, two, two, one, uh, by the way, you might also ask me why I, I never considered the eta minus, eta plus minus dagger. This is because they are compass conjugate to the, to the ones above. If the compass, uh, so conjugation uh, maps eta minus to eta plus. So then um, to be more precise, if I conjugate these guys, I obtain uh, plus here and plus minus here, thus reducing to the ones above. So this is why I never considered them. Uh, there is also another operation, which is the uh, da taking the dagger of the whole thing, which uh, um, maps, for example, this guy to eta two plus minus dagger Eta one, sorry. Eta one plus dagger. So uh, we need not consider these independently. 
but still we have three uh, possibilities left. It turns out by pure experimentation that the best to consider are these, they produce the um, A, the nicest equations, B, those that are eventually uh, equivalent to supersymmetry. We need not consider uh, these for some reason. I don't know a deep, um, a deep logic to explain this fact. So uh, I will introduce these symbols. I'll put the slash for, for this time. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I forget the slash. And so the five plus minus are polyforms. And I remind you also if theta two is theta one, then five plus is e to the minus aj. Five minus is omega up to a proportionality factor. Proportional, proportional. And we can now try to compute that uh, the exterior differentials of, uh, of these. When we did so for the purely in a short uh, case, we got uh, some funny operator on the right hand side where H was acting um, with, the, with the contraction and the wedge, a mixed contraction and a wedge. In this more general setting, um, it turns out that there's a, a better combination of, uh, of operators where you also involve the, the other, the other spinoral equations that uh, the ones that I, um, I didn't write. And again, by some experimentation, you finally find uh, that there's a combination where um, the equations become particularly nice. So you have two, uh, three equations. Again, upper sign is for 2a, lower sign is for 2b. I'll explain what this C minus is. It's a constant. C, my, uh, C plus is another constant. DH is D minus H wedge. In a sense, this DH already appeared because the, the Bianchi identities, um, so 
I'll put them here because we uh, we cannot solve these without also solving the Bianchi identities. If we also put the Bianchi identities, then also the vacuum, the equations of motion will follow. And the uh, the Bianchi identities for uh, capital F. We saw that they are DF equal HF. But of course, then become DH capital F equals zero. If you also um, use this um, vacuum um, assumption in terms of little f, then you end up with the DHF equals zero and the star lambda, sorry, d to the e for a star lambda dh star lambda f equals zero. Um, so these and the supersymmetry equations. So, okay. First of all, I, so far I told you that the supersymmetry implies these equations. So far, so good. But uh, then you can also show that they are equivalent to the supersymmetry equations. Only you should be careful that the phi plus minus are not just the, just any uh, differential forms, but they should imp, uh, they should um, have some compatibility conditions, kind of like the algebraic conditions that J and Omega had. Remember, also for Calabiao, okay, the the star are the <laughs> uh, the star equations are those that uh, the, the equations that always get attention are those that impose that J and Omega are closed. But behind the scenes, you also have the algebraic. Uh, conditions, namely the J wedge omega equals zero for uh, an FCT structure and the J cube is proportional to omega omega bar up to a certain constant. Same here. So if you have uh, the two forms, so uh, two uh, polyforms, phi plus and phi minus, they should obey some uh, algebraic conditions. You can think of it this way. So far, what, what did we do? We had two spinors and we associated to them some forms phi plus minus. Then questions, when can you go back? For what, uh, given two uh, form, uh, polyforms, phi plus and phi minus, when can you go back and find and say that they are uh, of this form that you can reconstruct from them two spinors? Well, the answer is known. This should be zero. Sorry. And the same, but with a contraction operator.
where this is a, some sort of uh, inner pod really appearing in six dimensions. It's uh, anti-symmetric. Where you say you take alpha wedge lambda of beta and you take the six form part. In this example, when phi plus and phi minus are of this form, e to the minus uh, e to the minus ij and omega, these become. Uh, this completely reduced to j wedge omega equals zero. And then there's a second condition. where this n squared is related to those two constants above. And this becomes this famous condition that we already used a few times So once again, these are just needed so that we know that uh, phi can be written in this way. The most general solution to these is known. To these algebraic conditions. Whereas then uh, you should look for the problem is completely reduced to this uh, set of uh, boxed equations. So these are now differential equations and are uh, harder. Harder, but still uh, they have a geometrical flavor. And in particular, uh, there are mathematicians who, who solve them. Sorry, this, uh, I forgot the, perhaps the best. Uh, phi plus minus this. the algebraic conditions include also this phi plus minus are uh, pure. This is a another algebraic condition that in uh, in the uh, example with j and omega, just says that omega becomes the fact that omega is decomposable. It's a version of decomposability. Uh, even with this, uh, so we, you know, the most general uh, pair of forms. Uh, still due to mathematicians, but uh, to, uh, um, more or less mathematicians understood all this. Uh, they had their own reasons to consider these uh, uh, conditions and they, and they, um, with their help, one can get the most general set of uh, solutions to these. So then 
<coughs> these, well, mathematicians haven't fully solved them, but they have considered some of those, some of them. And for example, so who's this mu? By the way, this mu is our old friend related to the cosmological constant. So for, uh, if we consider the case for mu equals zero, the second equation becomes the condition that there is a, a pure form, which is D closed or DH closed more generally. And this is called uh, twisted if h is non-zero. Generalized complex structure. And they were studied by Hitchin and Gualtieri for their own reasons, okay. It's uh, by chance that this appears. In physics as well. So recall that uh, this was my minus lambda over three. Uh, earlier, I just saw lambda equivalent to that lambda is minus three mu square. Okay. Um, now there will be several comments, but I'll uh, add one more. Uh, practically speaking, well, two more. If you, uh, you can play with these equations, in particular d squares to zero, but it turns out that also dh squares to zero. Uh, this is implied by the fact that dh is zero. And now, you can use this to play with these equations. If you, in particular, if you hit this with the H, if you act with the H on, uh, on the second equation, and mu is different from zero, you find that the first is reproduced. So the first equation is redundant. for non-zero mu. Perhaps more interestingly, if you, uh, the, if you, okay, sorry, C plus need to be zero. If you act with the H on the last equation, you find that this is zero because of the uh, imaginary part of the second. And so you are left with dh of this, but this is exactly the equation of motion. So 
So there are more amount flux equation of motion. Is also redundant. Finally, um, with the similar games, uh, let's say, if you if mu is different from zero, it turns out that uh, c minus needs to be zero. Um, once, uh, so even, so all the compact solutions, right. so if mu is zero, so there are oriented faults. or planes. Then C minus is zero as well. So basically this C minus is only useful for non-compact solutions, which of course are not what we're interested in. I would like to mention, uh, so the natural, uh, natural question is uh, why, so in, in doing, in uh, computing all this, uh, so there are quite a few simplifications and uh, the, uh, I think it's fair to say that the, it's a bit of a surprise that the equations uh, come out to be um, so simple. So the, these differential equations are quite simpler than the, the fermionic ones that they came from. And also the protagonists, uh, this phi plus minus are uh, forms that were considered by mathematicians for other reasons. So they, maybe there is something uh, hidden behind. So there are several interpretations that have been uh, put forward. So one is uh, so the, based on supergravity, so on four dimensional supergravity. So there is a, uh, for example, in n equal one supergravity. We didn't study n equal one supergravity. It's a simpler beast than the one, uh, than the n equal two supergravity we spent some time on. In particular, uh, it, well, just like the, n equal one um, rigid supergravity theories, uh, gauge theories say, it is based on a, um, so the crucial objects are a superpotential W. And the Keller potential K. And the uh, the potential, for example, is of this form.
Yeah, there's a famous factor of three. Uh, schematically, let me write here a mu squared. So this mu uh, is a moment map for the for the symmetries for, um, that are gauged by the um, well. Now this requires a long uh, will require a long, long longer discussion, but I I think you know more or less what I'm talking about because of your, your study of rigid theories. You had a sim very similar um, expression for a rigid theory where this basically went away. Goes to zero without gravity. Now for, without gravity, then you would have the, the equations for, Uh, for a vacuum, uh, the so-called D term equations. And then the F term equations. Now with gravity is no longer, so without gravity it's clear because this is a sum of squares. Without gravity, it is no longer that clear because you could imagine that uh, finding a more general vacuum. But uh, now these will be implied by the setting to zero the equations of motion. So this is still true. That this should be zero for a supersymmetric vacuum, not for a non-supersymmetric one. Well, in particular, then we see that the, uh, if you set this to zero, these will go to zero. Only this uh, um, new term remains, which means that there is um, a cosmological constant, a negative cosmological constant. And by the way, this tree, uh, you see then that uh, the um, cosmological constant is just minus three to the k w square, and you see that this is reminiscent of this formula. So mu is nothing but e to the k w. And the proposal, so it has been shown, let's say, pretty convincingly, that the, the first equation Let's give them a name. Uh, these are called Pius Pino equations. And the first is interpreted as a D term, which by the way explains the fact that it's uh, redundant for um, for Minkowski va for Minkowski vacuum for ADS vacuum. Whereas these become uh, two sets of equations because here the derivative can be with respect to the uh, two sets of, uh, uh, of uh, scalars that you can think of as, uh, as being the Kähler uh, moduli and the compressed structure moduli, more or less. So these are. 
So anyway, all these equations then have been interpreted uh, geometrically. Oh, sorry, I'm giving you the, here I was giving you the Minkowski case. Um, let's just write this. I don't want to rewrite the whole thing. Another interpretation involves uh, so-called calibrations. This is a mathematical object, an almost calibration. Is a form omega uh, with the property that omega restricted to any subspace. is in any point and along any subspace is always smaller than the volume form. Restricted to, um, so they, uh, in order to define it, you need to have some metric already. And it's called the calibration. If it's closed. This was defined by mathematicians to help them find or uh, constrain the space of uh, um, certain subspaces with uh, special properties. For example, um, J and omega of an SCT structure Both have these properties. Sorry, the first property, almost calibrations. A subspace is called Calibrated if along subspace S, if along it there is equality. So this um, inequality should be true as a property of the form, and it should be true uh, in whatever point you, uh, you look and in whatever direction for whatever uh, infinitesimal plane you consider. Then uh, if there is a subspace such that for at every point of the subspace and uh, for each direction tangent to the subspace, uh, this the equality holds, then you call that. Um, calibrated. And so, for example, uh, 
a two form, a two, an S2, sorry. Calibrated by J is called almost holomorphic. If M6 is a complex manifold, S2 is called holomorphic. And in that case, it has the property They can be defined by system or holomorphic equations. This calibration story is interesting because you, you can, it helps you put bounds on uh, so remember that I, I mentioned already this uh, holomorphic uh, subspaces uh, in the, because I told you my mathematicians are uh, interested in counting them and mirror symmetry in Calabi House gave you a, a very efficient way of counting them. It even gave uh, generating functions for all the possible um, holomorphic subspaces uh, in any uh, homology class. In particular, it, puts a, it helps you put a bound on um, on the volume. Suppose SK is calibrated consider another S prime K and in the same homology class. Typically, you can think of it as a deformation. So that's, and I don't know. This is S prime. And among the two, there will be a, so between the two, there will be something which you can call uh, N. So by definition, since they're in the same homology class, S K minus S prime K is the boundary of something. Then the volume of S prime K is the integral over a span K of uh, the volume form. But because of the calibration property, this is the, just the restriction to a span K of Omega. But now, uh, By because of this, you can write also this. But now Stokes tells us that this can be rewritten as d omega on nk plus one. 
So if omega is a calibration, so here, okay, suppose omega is a calibration. At the, in the first step, I just used, here I just used that uh, it's an almost calibration. In the second step, I'm using that it's closed here. And this now, since omega is calibrated, is the integral of the volume form. So it's a volume OSK. So long story short, the volume of S prime is larger or equal than the volume of SK. So SK minimizes the volume in its homology class. Why do we care or do we care? Well, in physics, we do have some subspaces that in, a, in string theory, we do have some subspaces that we care about, namely brains. It turns out that uh, because of their definition, these are almost calibrations. This is just an algebraic property that follows from uh, the way they were uh, written and um, defined in terms of spinos. Showing this will be fun, but I uh, ask you to believe me. And this echoes the, my previous statement that J and omega when I see to structure are almost calibrations. Now you might say, but uh, Look, why should they be closed? We computed D of these guys and they, they didn't come out to be uh, closed. Right, but for that matter, uh, physical brains don't, shouldn't minimize their volume. You might say, oh yeah, the, I, my intuition is that they want to shrink. Yeah, you would be correct, but they, uh, the action of a brain doesn't just contain um, the, the a volume term. There's a DBI term that tends to, the Dirac von Infel term in the brain action that tends to shrink them. But there's also another term in their action. And that, so the total, which uh, couples to the Ramon Ramon fields. So the, in total, uh, they don't want to minimize the volume, but they want to minimize some, something else which contains the volume, but uh, is uh, the, an energy. And it turns out that you can rewrite the pure spinor equations as the generalization of, of a calibration appropriate for so that it, uh, it's not minim uh, what is minimized is not volume but energy. In particular, the last. Uh, equation, the one I just uh, boxed, subboxed, gets um, interpreted as a generalization of the calibration story for uh, space filling brains. So, anyway, generalization 
of the closure condition. Few spin of equations. Few spin of equations are exactly the conditions so that. Uh, brains calibrated by um, phi plus and minus. This depends on which uh, theory you're considering to A or to B. Minimize not volume, but energy as, sh as should be. physical energy of the brains. And so in, in, in principle, if you could have obtained these equations directly by thinking about brains without even uh, looking at the supersymmetry equations. It's not entirely clear to me why this is so, but uh, it appears to be an important property. Sorry, I should give you some reference. This is discussed, for example, in a paper by Martucci and Smith. And the earlier um, uh, supergravity interpretation that I gave was discussed also by Martucci, but there was also an N equal to uh, version discussed uh, by one of our organizers, um, Davide Cassani, and by Grania, Louis, and Waldron. Anyway, so uh, if you're interested, write to me and I'll give you more references. But I want to end on a more concrete note. So I will give you some, now a discussion of examples. First, a concrete class, again from Minkowski. And then I'll, uh, uh, so it's difficult to choose a particular, so for ADS, there are many, many solutions. It's uh, possible to organize them in some way, but I'll uh, give you a table instead of uh, just giving you, running through individual examples. So first, the, uh, the Minkowski, first I'll give you a, an important Minkowski class, which, we, uh, which uh, to be clear, it has been, which has been found earlier than these methods and it's much simpler to find. Oof. But still it would have required us um, quite a lot of work in, um, in our previous language. So first of all, for orientifolds, orientifolds are defined by involutions Symmetric state square to zero. To one, sorry. The identity. R, P. Um, such that they fix P plus one directions and the Fixed locus is called an OP plane. And these have also um, uh, a particular action on the, on the pure spinos, on those pure forms, sorry. Uh, 
uh, this plays particularly well with that um, calibration interpretation also. So the, the action on, for example, on phi plus minus should be, there's some P dependent sign. Uh, not particularly illuminating, but this is uh, how the orientifolds should act on the phis. In particular, let's see what happens. So you see here that there's always a periodicity. This uh, P appears with a P over two integer part of it. So the, uh, there's a, a periodicity uh, between P and P plus four. So in particular, nothing really changes if we uh, consider NO3 or NO7. Both of these will act on the, in the same way. If you take P equal three or P equal seven in this formula, you will get the same. Let's say we take our simplest example here. I have put here a phase um, because it doesn't spoil any of the conditions that we saw earlier. Oh, um, can be more specific actually. Uh, if you remember uh, when we computed this in, uh, uh, in the Neuro Schwartz lecture, there was here the norm of the, of the spinos and this turns out to be just E to the A. C minus equals zero, like for any example where there are orientifolds. So from the earlier conditions, uh, you can uh, find that the norm of the spin uh, such that this is true. And this can be inserted for free. That's it, um, if you put it in there, the algebraic conditions that we saw are still satisfied. But, but uh, with these, by imposing these conditions, uh, what you find is that the, uh, this theta, a priori it's a function, but um, RP, either three or seven. So this, by the way, this means uh, the uh, pullback. So it just means that you act both on the, uh, on the, this is an involution, meaning that it's a symmetry. The local label um, might uh, reverse the sign to some coordinates. And now this RP star just means that you reverse the sign both of the coordinates and to the legs of the forms. So if you have dx, um, it will descend to minus dx. But this is a function, so uh, this just says that theta evaluated in RP, R, R3 uh, of the coordinates. Is pi minus theta in the coordinates. So on the fixed locus, Where d is equal, where this is uh, equal to this, uh, then theta should be pi over two. Let's make an answer that theta is pi over two everywhere. Uh, 
and then impose the few spinner equations. Given this, this, and these ansatz, the p spinner equations uh, can be simplified. Just look at them degree by degree. All those phi plus and phi minus were polyforms, and the f's are also polyforms. But you just, uh, with some patience, you you can see what they lead to, and I give you the the result. But this is an exercise, if you want. In this particular case, you get something quite nice. Whoops, I wrote the same thing twice. So the F are completely determined because you remember there was an equation which had internal F equals something in terms of the files. So the, you don't have to um, make answers for the flux. They'll, uh, the Raman Raman forms will just be completely determined in general. Consequences. These smell a bit like our old F theory class. They are very similar. Indeed, by uh, just rescaling, we can see that. So if we just redefine J, we'll have uh, DJ equals zero. And this will now become not the omega equals zero if we rescale omega in the same way, but uh, it'll be the omega equal some uh, defy wedge omega. So these two together imply that the space is scalar. Once again. With the rescaling. So Precise about this. The ten dimensional metric is e to the two A. Ah, oh, sorry. I mean, Koski class, right? So let me underline it mu equals zero. So more precisely, this is the killer. Uh, metric. So I usually call this the conformal killer class.
it was found in papers um, by by Seti and collaborators, uh, collaborators uh, Rajesh Seti, uh, by Ganya Polchinski, by Gidin Skaccio Polchinski, and there were, uh, and the, uh, so with uh, based also on work by uh, Becker and Becker. That's a long history. This also has a nice consequence. Remember the G3 that we defined at some point, but um, by its definition, we see that it's imaginary self dual, namely the star on it gives an eye. Uh, there's no problem because G is complex the way we defined it. Uh, there is a fancier way to write it, which is um, a consequence. If you use also these facts, these two facts. You find that uh, G is a to one form. And this condition that H where J is zero. So the to one form is basically, basically comes, because, uh, comes about because of the first H where omega. Uh, but um, the second is called primitivity. If you, if you have a tree form, Uh, which uh, whose wedge with G with J is zero, you call it primitive. There's a whole theory behind this, but I, we didn't have time. In principle, this is stronger than this. It turns out that you can uh, find supersymmetry breaking solutions where this is true and this is not. So the equations of motion are still satisfied if you uh, impose this weaker condition. He said that here I wrote moreover because this is a stronger condition. This implies this, but the opposite is not true. And there are vacuum that uh, where this is true and the equation of motion is dissatisfied, but super symmetry is not. Finally, this guy here uh, implies that uh, Del Bartau is zero. So you can view this as a uh, enrichment of the um, F-theory class. It is slightly different because now phi for, and A, for example, are no longer proportional. And in the F-theory class, phi was 4A. Yeah, and uh, if you put phi equal 4A here, you see that uh, the E2, D2A becomes an overall factor. And moreover, uh, people who like working in the so-called um, Einstein frame, uh, we'll find that the, in that case, the, the metric is really a direct product. For the F theory class, the, the metric is a direct product um, with the Keller um, manifold. But in this more general class that we, uh, uh, we just found, there's a generalization. So in six is Keller, the, the same uh, logic that applied to the um, the F theory class still applies, and you can still find that uh, not only is it Keller, but the, uh, it is final. And Yao's theorem tells you that you can find the. Um, so there will be an extra condition on the uh, Ricci form of the precise uh, Ricci form, but uh, Yao's theorem allows you in this case as well to, to tell you that um, solution exists. For Minkowski, 
I would like to tell you that there are lots more solutions, but this is not the case. There are a few more solutions. Uh, so th there are many non-compact ones, but somehow whenever you try to impose compactness, uh, the, you run in some trouble or another. This is in part because of the presence of these uh, orientifolds. But at least you can uh, start with, uh, so if you want to warm yourself up and you're interested in uh, this problem, you can uh, do the same exercise uh, in, with theta. By the way, I should, <laughs> should have said that this was in two way, of course. It's implicit in the fact that we use the O3, O7. And you can try to use t equals zero. This is compatible instead with the no five. And see what uh, what you'll find. The conditions lead to a manifold which is still complex. But not Kayla. This is what you should find. Another exercise is in two way. Uh, here you don't really need to do any uh, assumption except this. So the exercise is to still use this assumption. Uh, there are more general solutions. I said that the most general algebraic solution to the um, solution to the algebraic equations is known. I didn't give you the expression for the most general solution. For these lectures, I have uh, used only this uh, solution that contains an SCT structure. So do. Uh, in two way, you'll find that M6 with this assumption, you'll find that M6 is symplectic. You find also that F0 and F4 and F6 are all zero. Hence, the such a solution only contains F2. And when you, uh, then you can lift it to M theory. If you do so, you, uh, you will find a supersymmetric solution, supersymmetric Minkowski solution of uh, uh, 11 dimensional supergravity without any flux because F2 in uh, M theory becomes part of the metric. And such a solution is Minkowski times a G2 manifold, a G2 holonomy manifold. I'll put this in a parenthesis because we didn't um, discuss G2 holonomy manifolds. We discussed holonomy. In seven dimensions, you have this possibility of having manifolds uh, whose uh, holonomy is, is restricted to G2 rather than SU3. Uh, finally, let me say something about uh, mu different from zero. I can offer a very schematic uh, table. Yeah, on this occasion, I, I will put il also 11 dimension supergravity for free. We are not really de deriving any of these uh, discussions, so uh, any of these solutions. So I'll just put.
those as well here. So many solutions of M theory of 11 dimensions supergravity come from are related by duality to 2A. I will write here, but there are those with, uh, which do not have this property in 2A. Uh, if you have F not the Roman's mass F not non-zero, uh, then you cannot go to M theory. And so I'll put those independently here. If you have very large, um, very large amount of supersymmetry here, you have a seven or a seven more gamma. We saw this yesterday. We saw that the near horizon limit of uh, M2 brains produces like this four times a seven. But there is also a possibility of um, quotienting by uh, a discrete subgroup, and that can break the supersymmetry to n equal four, for example. In two A with non-zero Roman's mass, uh, question mark. I don't know. I don't think anyone knows the solution here. In two B, there is a nice set of solutions. Let me, so I write this um, arrow here. And this means fiber. So this is a bundle with the fiber over a base. This is not the official notation, uh, but I, I'm using it anyway. So here, these are two, two spheres, so four dimensions, and they, um, the fibers over a disk or over an analysis. These are the, so if you know some holography, you know that um, ADS4 solutions should be dual to three-dimensional CFTs. And these are the so-called uh, Hanani-Witten CFTs. I don't know if these were discussed. For n equal three, we have uh, something called the three Sasaki. This is a uh, defined so that the cone over these are so called hyperkähler manifolds. So the this is an analog, um, so uh, hyperkähler manifold is an analog of uh, Kähler manifold where there are three complex structures that uh, uh, have uh, some properties that uh, resemble those of uh, the three imaginary units of quaternions. So I square is not only do we have then a complex structure, I is such that uh, its square is uh, minus one, minus the identity, but also j such that uh, its square is minus one, k that also squares to minus one, and then ij is k, jk is i, ki is j. So this is m7, here I'm putting the uh, m7 manifold, and this is the internal s6, uh, m6. Here there's a single solution known. I mean, right here, these are notable known solutions. Um, I think this was found in uh, 
2015 by Guarino uh, and uh, Varela and other people as well, Pang and Rong. I credit uh, Guarino and Varela more. Here we find, for n equal two, we find our friends, the Sasaki Einsteins. Um, but we also have some solutions where there is a distorted S4 of a hyperbolic space. Hyperbolic three dimensional space. In 2A, we have something similar. Again, there's a topological S6. This is a solution by uh, Guarino Jafferis and Varela, also more or less around the same time. The CP3. In 2008. And then there is a class where you have a, a, a topological S2 fibered over some Keller Einstein manifolds. We should be clear what I mean by Keller Einstein. It's a manifold which is both Keller and, and Einstein. Einstein means that the uh, uh, Ricci tensor is proportional to the metric. Maybe 17, something like that. Uh, I'm putting you these dates to show you how uh, things are progressing. The MTR column was uh, basically, so these, these, these were known for a long time. Almost all of it was known for a long time. Here there's something called the weak G2. Um, well, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> so I can, I can tell you if you ask me. It's an old geometrical condition, so this is very old. And then there are a bunch of solutions uh, which have the topology of a seven sphere. And here, lots of solutions. So, you can find cosets, nearly Keller manifolds, And this are uh, more or less found. From 2007 onwards. And here, there's one solution. Found this year. And then there are several, let's say, in all these cases,
a few as false. And these are manifolds where you glue the space to itself with an S-duality. This is a, a bit like what happens in F-theory, only there is no holomorphic um, tau. The setup is a lot more basic. So in 2B, there's a very rich class here. These are infinitely many. These classes here, um, infinitely many for n equal four, but so far almost nothing for uh, smaller CPS symmetry. I'm reasonably um, uh, sure that there, a lot is going to uh, come out in the next few years here. So basically, as you can see, very little was known um, for a few years, only this same theory column until the um, 2005, only the, these ones, the circled ones in the empty column were known. This was found in uh, also in, uh, what was it? Also nine maybe. And then in the last um, 10, 12 years, um, there was an acceleration, especially in the last five years. So lots of ADS solutions have been emerging. Uh, some, I can see that I only have a few minutes left. You probably would have wanted comments about um, a positive cosmological constant rather than negative. Well, um, there are a few reasons why that topic is more contentious. Here we have, so in these lectures, we have looked for solutions uh, directly in 10 dimensions mostly. But like I mentioned at the beginning of this, this lecture today, um, there is also the, the other possibility of uh, working in four dimensions. And to, so first to derive an effective four dimensional theory based on some particular manifold that you and know and love and trust in particular, for which you think you can derive reasonably well an, uh, an effective theory. And then uh, you modify it in some way or another so that you try to look for a vacuum. This is uh, in practice, I mentioned earlier the Cosette case, but in the, the Cosette case is fine, but uh, usually not for an effective theory. It's good for classical solutions. But for example, if you try to, uh, to include also, uh, to go beyond pure supergravity, um, basically uh, the, the reductions uh, that you trust are the, those on uh, Calabi House. And you'll notice that the, uh, still today uh, in uh, Minkowski, all the classes that I told you about are the, with Calabi House. There are a few outliers, but uh, uh, mostly we know what we are doing for Calabi House. For EDS, um, I try to show you here just with this table that there are lots and lots of possibilities. But uh, for all of these, only in, few, only in a very few cases you have the, uh, you have the possibilities of trying and uh, uh, modify these solutions so that you achieve a positive cosmological constant. Basically because you don't have this uh, uh, effective action point of view. Now, the, uh, by far the most um, studied and trusted model uh, for the CITA so far has been the so-called KKLT model, which is based on this uh, supersymmetry breaking um, class. So the, on the supersymmetry breaking version of this uh, conformal Keller class. So you, you modify it by, uh, you start from that and you modify it with uh, non-perturbative corrections to supergravity. 
then people have tried to uh, to um, to find uh, other similar constructions, but uh, still to this day, uh, I would say we, we cannot do uh, really a lot. Basically, because uh, so for, uh, with supergravity, as you can see, it can be pretty precise and rigorous, but uh, because you know all the equations of motion. But with, uh, when you try to go beyond it, you need to make some approximations and, uh, uh, and there, I mean, then this is where the fight uh, starts. Uh, since I, 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 for a meaningful discussion of the sitter, I would have, I, I would need more time. Um, well, I guess I'll, uh, I will more or less leave you here. I, <laughs> the, um, as you know, there are, uh, there, so perhaps I, I should mention one last thing. As you know, the, there are uh, by now uh, several people who have come to uh, suspect that, uh, in fact, there are no DeSita solutions as well. Uh, that's based on uh, on a topic called the, the um, uh, swampland which is in part based by some general expectations about quantum gravity theories and in part on extrapolation from the uh, known features of uh, supergravity solutions. My opinion is that the first part of this endeavor is uh, very well motivated, uh, that which is uh, um, motivated by general features of uh, uh, quantum gravity theory. So it involves uh, thought experiments with uh, black holes and uh, it should be taken very seriously. Uh, the part where we, so the, which is extrapolated from uh, supergravity solutions is a bit dangerous in my opinion, because uh, the point of this table also was, is to show you that uh, when we, uh, when holography gave us, uh, so basically I think, uh, why has, this, has there been this explosion of, uh, uh, new solutions in uh, ideas four. Well, it, it's because holography has given new motivation to look for it. Because ADS four bef uh, is dual to SCFT three, and uh, until um, fifteen years ago, not much was known about supersymmetric three-dimensional CFTs or how to find their duals. So, uh, with the basically with the um, construction of the AVGM CFT, a lot of um, interest uh, uh, focused on uh, ADS4 and uh, many new solutions are found. Maybe that's my sociological interpretation. There are also some technical uh, reasons that uh, new techniques uh, became available, including the Pispina equations. Uh, but you see, uh, there's been also a lot of progress in the last five years. So. I would say that before we start extrapolating um, uh, conjectures from the known solutions, we have to wait um, some more. I'm sorry if these lectures feel incomplete, but this is because our knowledge on these topics uh, is very incomplete. And so perhaps uh, some of you will uh, help us and make it um, more complete in the future. I'll stop the recording now. Okay.